Jeffrey, it is always my pleasure to be speaking with you. It's been a little while. How are you doing? Uh, fine. You know, I feel like when we don't talk, nothing really matters. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then when we do talk, things the history is, uh, you know, is, is set on its right course again. It's like there's a forward motion to it. So, well, you know, that that would be the case if more people actually saw these conversations. Um, but that's a whole. Well, we well, might. But get... it doesn't matter. I mean, I think for you and I talking to each other, it just helps us both. You know, it helps that's us true. to sort through. And I think <clears throat> the good thing about our friendship and the way we we speak is that we're we're both, you know, on one hand, kind of ferociously dogmatic on the other hand we're we're we're, uh, we're adaptable and there's a, there's enough there's enough that we don't know that is it's that we're discovering every day that it's fun to fun to talk about it you know we we share the same values uh yes. but uh but we, we both have this sort of this malleable strategic outlooks that that enable us to uh uh you know it's it's funny as i think back in the old days when i, when I was corresponding with mary rothbard a lot, you know, before the age of email. Can you believe I lived before email? Anyway, um, and he, I used to talk to him about strategy all the time. And, and he had this funny view that it's like, okay, we know we believe in freedom. We know we believe, we believe in human rights. But uh, getting from here to there is, is, is a difficult problem. And he said, there can be no dogma when it comes to strategy. The only rule is don't, don't do bad and moral things. But beyond that, our strategy is extremely important. Um, and, the quote that and, comes and to mind is the um, is that old saw, you know, uh, he who has a why can bear any how. Well, yeah, I've never heard that old saw, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember who said it, but that's, he, yeah, I think saw. that's what you're talking about, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's um, any means, any means to the end, as long as the means is not itself contrary to the end. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and so on and so forth. Um, actually, that's, that, that's kind of a big conversation to be had there probably, because I think we live at a time where a lot of people are justifying all kinds of means that are at odds with their ends by ends, if you followed that. Yeah, give me an example of what you mean by that. Um, well, there's a lot of, in, you know, there's a lot of talk of social justice um, and people, uh seem to be some people some people um seem to have allowed blatant abuses of justice as ways to get to their oh. particular favored version of justice i guess that's probably the issue i'm raising in the most general the states most generally oh. um yeah well a lot of people want to want to get to public health uh but as a mere slogan but with, with while destroying public health public health yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's I mean, this is the issue that that, that brought us together for this in the preceding conversation that we had. Yeah. So, um, well, let's start there. I think you've just started. You started. <laughs> well, the okay, substance. Okay. Well, let's, let's go. Let, yeah, let's uh, let me just uh, uh, raise an issue that I think you'll find fascinating. I think I think it's something on which we would we would completely agree, which is that there is such a thing as public health. Which for normal people in the normal normal life, uh, that would not be a controversial statement. But you know, uh, <laughs> and and the and the the you know, the anar anarcho capitalist uh, you know libertarian anarchist world, that that sounds sounds uh, suspicious because the word public, public itself yeah. uh, right. implies something. It's a trigger word. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't necessarily think it's necessary to always think about the word public which i mean you probably you can explain the greek origins of that term uh but or latin i think it's greek right but anyway um but i don't think it necessarily means the state it can mean the state but it can also mean the community or the lives we share together as a, as a people and and as an experience with each other um and so so I, didn't, I don't think you, the word public is necessarily like a swear word, you know, and I, I, I have been for the last, since I founded Brownstone, been defending the idea of public health. Mm. And, and uh, I would say the more the, the purification or the realization of its ideals, as opposed to lockdowns, mandates, and, you know, stay home orders and uh, life destroying uh, edicts, uh, genuine public health has to consider the, the, uh, 
you know, the, the broader health concerns and also not just short term, but long term, these things. But my understanding, and so just today I had, a, again, I, you know, I truly I've lost owners over this question, if you can believe it. But I had a, a, a guy, is that you're making that noise or is that me making that noise? That Oh, I, I hear you me. clearly. Okay. Um, so I had a donor write me today and said, look, you've got to stop using this, this term public health. I think we need, there's only individual health. Well, I don't really understand that because it's not really true. Um, uh, I, as far as I understand the, the history of public health, it, the idea of public health came about in the late 19th century and it originated in Britain when there was a growing sense that it's because we all live in the same city Right. Uh, uh, and we all use this, you know, we, the services we share are, are, are truly shared services, you know, like there's the, the well, uh, the, the sanitation, you know, the streets, these kinds of things, whether they're owned by the state or owned by the private, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about who owns them. I'm talking about what, what services we share together, you know, what, what, what things we consume as, uh, as, uh, together is what you know what do we have in common as a community um and and those things you know are are the air and the water and the water and the streets and a, and a general sense of well-being within within the realm and uh so when cholera gets into the water system that's bad <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea of public health is to ferret out the source of the pathogen clean it up and so that we can live longer, better, healthier lives. And, and so that, that gave rise to, I think, a very legitimate concern, uh, concern profession, uh, even discipline, which is to, to understand what, what are the conditions in the community that no one individual kinda, can, 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 can change, but, mm. but every single individual uh, benefits or is harmed by. Right, so I'm not necessarily talking about a public good. That's slightly different. I'm talking about just the the general uh, feeling uh, uh, in the community about you know what's good. You know, do you, <clears throat> do you have access when you drink a glass of water? Is it going to uh, kill you, or um, quench your thirst? You know, um, these sorts of things. When you look out into the street, is there going to be uh, a, a t a trash and and uh, dangers all around you, or is it going to generally give you a sense of cleanliness and, and uplift. And I would say the same thing is true for, for clean air and, and, uh, and other general conditions of living. Now, whether that's uh, provided through free enterprise or through uh, status means is, is, is another question entirely, but the ideal itself, I think is still uh, survives and it's completely compatible with a liberal. And in fact, uh, I would say essential to, and it's given rise uh, by the ex the existence of a sort of liberal liberal democracy, you know that that gave us progress and modernity, and so with that comes public health. And I and it outrages me to see that what I see as a beautiful ideal being contorted and distorted for other means, other purposes. Um, hmm. It does seem that the examples that you're giving there, Jeffrey, they do involve public goods. Uh, they do. Um, the reason to even have the notion of public good mm -hmm. rather than just let's consider sorry public health rather than just consideration of everybody's health the public health is the the sum of the health of individuals uh -huh. would seem to be that the usefulness of that idea would seem to be that we need these let's say goods or facilities or services that cannot be owned by an individual mm -hmm. unless you have a property rights issue to work effectively right um okay so i think when i use the word public good i'm using it in an economic sense meaning that it implies a market failure yes or, okay uh, yeah and i'm not suggesting that um uh, that the market cannot provide public health I, I think the market can provide public health but the market is necessarily community directed as much as it is driven forward by individual decision making these things go together as as adam smith was at pains to uh, constantly point out in his work which we can, still can't hear that the the one and the many are not in conflict in this case in danger although i'm in danger here of getting into another one of our uh, classic anarchy minarchy discussions you did mention uh, the um sanitation 
uh, issues around the sanitation uh, as they were addressed by the English for the first time in London in the 1800s. That's right. And there was a massive work, massive, well, public works, um, of building sewage systems and massive sanitation systems that did start in England. And I, I wonder if actually state action, state violation of private property uh, was necessary to get those all working. Um, I'm not sure there was at the time any, perhaps it's my lack of imagination, any market mechanism by which the, uh, um, the, the, the space and resources could have been commandeered to mm -hmm. have produced what was produced with the massively positive effect, as fast mm -hmm. as that positive effect was had back in well, those times. Yeah. Am I, I wrong about that? Uh, I don't know the history well enough, but I would say that the smart entrepreneur could come in and, and, and buy up all the property, necessary property rights, and 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 people would be willing to pay for that. So I don't, I, I don't, I don't necessarily. Say, I mean, I've been part of too many fully uh, private communities with have <clears throat> that have good conditions of public health to to doubt that it's possible. And I also okay. tend to think that the state would would uh, uh, abuse uh, the emergence of something like a cholera out outbreak or stinky streets or, you know, uh, horse excrement all, all over the place, you know, it, as, a, as a way of saying, oh, look, the market has failed. We have to do this for ourselves. But I would say that it's, it, the, the, nonetheless, there were great achievements uh, in those days by, by the very means you talked about, which you can call them state and status means or not, but, but they, they achieved something, something that, Government, government did did good things, you know, when it mm -hmm. cleaned up the water supply and and provided for better sanitation. So uh, that so so in that case, I would find the presence of a of a good government state, you know, doing good public health, preferable to cholera outbreaks and and uh, and catastrophe all around us. So. <laughs> indeed, well, indeed, indeed. All right, so let's not, let's not do too much of that. So anyway, I don't have any problem using this term. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it struck me as funny, you know, when I founded Brownstone, that suddenly I faced, you know, this, this famous anarcho-capitalist or something, that it became like a source of controversy. This is the, you know, sort of the, our, our ridiculously doctrinaire uh, community, you know, excessively focused on definitions of words. Uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that this would somehow create a scandal, you know, that an anarcho-capitalist was talking about public health. I mean, to me, it's, it's not, it's not a, a problem at all to talk mm -hmm. about public health. I mean, it really does matter to me. Adam Smith, again, I always go back to the theory of moral, moral sentiments here, you know, this, this great book that I just adore by Adam Smith. But, you know, he, he starts the thing by saying, you know, if your neighbor is suffering, you suffer too. You know, um, we... We don't like stories of of, uh, of tragedy because they they hurt us individually. They hurt us psychologically and personally. We we aspire for the betterment of not just ourselves but for others too, and for the whole community. Maybe not in a universal sense, but certainly in the realm in which we we live. We we want we want the good of all. We we just do, and that's what the human personality is about. So I think that's. And it's very interesting to read Adam Smith, you know, and I, I think, I think, I think he's right about this. You know, there is something about us that we do aspire um, in our highest uh, thoughts to to live in a in a in a better in a better world, not not just to be rich and and bathing in our, our bathtub full of full of Bitcoin, but but uh, but to uh, to live in a community where we we believe that everybody can live better and everybody has a chance do you find that you are proportionately emphasizing these kind of things more in your work now than you used to oh, and you know. no yeah yeah for yeah sure. you know and that. and have you had any moments then of as a result of that having to ponder how you are seen by let's say your libertarian base do you feel you've had to make some kind of choices uh, that you didn't have to make before with respect to support from your, your let's say, your hardcore followers of before? Yeah, or is it not really sure. that bad? Um, I, I for sure made a choice. And the choice has been to um, 
to tell what I see to be the truth and to do the good that I see to be the good, regardless of the weird um, t- tribe of, with which I'm associated. So I, I really don't care. Have I mean, you seen that? Have you paid a price in terms uh, of reach because of that? Uh, oh, my, oh, most certainly. Oh, absolutely. I have. Right. No, I mean, <laughs> you can see it all the time. I mean, you know, what do we know? But um, yeah, people are, people are always saying, oh, he abandoned you know, this crowd. He abandoned that crowd. You know, he betrayed us. He did this bad yeah. thing. He's, yeah, so this is, this is a constant sort of thing. But it never really, never really cuts deeply, really, because I, I, I think in my heart, I feel like I've always wanted to, you know, say what's what's true, mm. and I really don't care. You know, I don't care what uh, what uh, what people are saying. I mean, it's just it's a it's a silly thing to me. Um, my job is not to please the in group. I mean, I I'm not a a dancing bear. You know, um, uh, I don't even believe uh, in in and ideological tribalism. I, I, th- I think it's very dangerous, actually. But, so, but, but given that you're not in the business of throwing red meat, we'll accept that. Do you ever feel the tension between um, just telling your truth and damn the torpedoes, um, or let's say telling some part of your truth in a certain way, such that it reaches more people and has more positive effect? Or do you I think that's all just... So I, so I, I can't do it. I can't do yeah. it. You no, know, I I'm just not good at that. You know, right. I, I guess, I guess when I sit down to, to, you know, to think about an issue and write about it, um, I, my main goal is to that the article makes sense to whoever has uh, bothered to take time to read it. You know, if it, if it makes yeah. sense and they can see the point and they can enter into my, my thought process, um and <clears throat> maybe come away with a, a different perspective slightly or not um that's all i really want um i i've never been good at playing to a certain audience and i'm just and because i can the reason i'm not because i don't want to be good at that either because i can yeah. i can sniff that out you know really quickly i mean we all listen to enough podcasts and we can tell the the thinkers and and writers and intellectuals who are playing to the audience it's most and, isn't it most uh, are playing it, to an audience, aren't they? Well, everybody's an entertainer these days. I think mm. that's I think that's happened to us. You know, everybody's just set out to figure out how to commodify themselves and market themselves to the largest possible group they can. And and yeah, it's I think it's rather despicable, actually. Um, so I'm uh, you know I don't I don't set out to offend people. That that's not the the goal, but but to uh, curry favor and. Um, you know, to acquiesce to certain ideological biases. Now, explaining things in, in ways that that the people say on the on the right or the left can understand uh, better by using that sort of terminology, uh, terminology and language that that is understandable. But if if the whole goal is to you know to reinvent myself for every new audience sure. that I have, I mean that I I, th- I think that's uh, that's really cynical, and I just have no interest. I have no interest in that, and. Uh, you know, I've been around long enough now that I realize that over the long term, you know, you're you're considered to be right um, uh, and 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 more, I would say, heroic if you're right after having suffered yes. through a, you know a year or two of 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 slings and arrows, you know. And I've that's what I've gone through the last couple of years. I and mean, when lockdowns first came along, I said this is the worst thing I've ever seen, and it's got to stop immediately. <clears throat> and uh, even on the question of masks, you know, I mean, I, I, I posted something like, I don't know what the date was, maybe it was the first week of April 2020 that was denouncing masks as an obsequious deference to authority or something like that. And wow, that, you know, the post went wild and, and I, I faced enormous denunciation from quarters that were completely unexpected to me. But now, you know, that that post went live again you know a couple of weeks ago and everybody's like ah oh, you were right all along you know so you're way better off just calling it as you see it as far as i'm concerned so let's talk some more about your extraordinary output under the auspices of brownstone when was it founded and how mm-hmm. many roughly speaking how many articles have been put out um by Brownstone, and how many of those have been written by you? Because I, I, I'm just <laughs> astonished by the output. I mean, it. I, I, yeah. I can't even 
that's a, it's, 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 a, really path, it's a pathology, but you know, you have to, uh, but the history is moving very fast, right? So you have to sort of keep up with it. And I've learned to be a chronicle, a chronicler of events. And I'll go back to my mentor, Murray Rothbard. You know, he he always did this. He always had to. He felt like he had to uh, react to and explain the events all around him. And and I feel that you know passion every day. I think uh, let's see. So I, I founded this thing in, in May of 2020, but it took between May and August one, uh, 2021. Sorry. Uh, to just get the infrastructure in place. It's, it's hard to found a new institute, you know, with a nonprofit status and all the third-party plugins and the, you know, the websites and the social media assets and everything. It's just, it's just endless to found anything. And, and uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story in a second. Um, but then we went live August 1st and, and I already had uh, 50 articles that had been lined up, you know, or so. You know, when I, when I, and I, by going live, it was funny the way I did it. I just, I decided not to make an announcement. I'm not saying the brownstone Institute. It's like, nah, I'm just going to sneak into everybody's worldview. Just, just slightly, just sneak in and then become a permanent part. So all I did was send one tweet. Oh, here's an interesting article. Huh. Interesting. And then, you know, gradual discovery. So like that. And it was, it was funny. It's, I've, I've, I've been around long enough to know how the internet works right so if you're if you're viral uh for 48 hours you could die you know the next day and i didn't want to do that so i just wanted to uh become a permanent um part of the uh public conversation so i just so snuck into existence you know but i think in the meantime we've published probably 600 articles and probably i've written i would say 200 of those yeah that's incredible well and, and you've got a day job jeffrey yeah, I do have a job. Yeah, I do have a job, but it's not brownstone, <laughs> which is great. You know, it's, it's one of the funny things that people on the left don't get very routinely don't understand economics at all. They think that we think the only thing that motivates us is money, right? Well, I'm living proof <laughs> because I don't make any money from brownstone at all, and I probably work eight to 10 hours a day on it. So, what's been the evolution of your experience? Uh, of um, well, let's say you could about the you know the reception of the kind of content that Brownstone is putting out. Well, I have to tell you, and I I think back at our old conversations. I and sometimes sometimes when you talk, um, uh, you have thoughts and I have thoughts, and and it's only after we finish the conversation I think I think I know what he was saying, but I'm not entirely sure. You know, this happens to me all the time when I think about you and your orientation. Um, and I think you and I have had for years a debate we've never actually had, but it's been b- beneath the surface about like what's worth the left or the right. I think we've had this kind of struggle, <laughs> right? We've had this sort of struggle between which us, poison would you pick? <laughs> yeah. I don't think we've ever put it that way. And uh, and in the course of my career, I've changed my mind. So, yeah, maybe several times, but I think. Um, doing a, a dominant part of the, since we've been speaking, I, I had written this book, you know, attacking the right. And you were kind of pushing back at me. Like, I don't know. I mean, I kind of get your point, but the left is really bad. I was like, no, but you don't understand the right is really bad. Um, so uh, what I'm curious about right now, at Brownstone, uh, my strong, I, and I don't ask these questions about my writers. I, I don't ever ask about their politics. You know, I don't, I don't even care, but um, like I had a nurse uh, send me an article today that will bring you bring you to tears. I mean, it's just so beautiful what happened to her when the when lockdowns came out. And you know, she had dedicated her life to serving other people, and now she was denied the chance to serve other people. And all the her clients that she was working with, she was a public health nurse. Um, she couldn't get to them, couldn't visit their homes. Uh, telling stories of her own clients not being able to go out and get groceries because they're banned from the grocery stores, you know, for either being unvaccinated or uh, testing positive for COVID or, you know, some, some nonsense, you know, the segregationist yeah. mentality where, and, and having her heartbreak again and again and again, and then, and then uh, having delivered a number of inoculations to people. And at some point, some guy says, look, I just want you to know that I'm only taking this inoculation because I'm, I'm forced to, or else I'll lose my job. And she pulled the needle away from him and she said, and put it down and said, you know what? I didn't give 
I didn't get into this job to uh, give uh, forced forced medicine on anybody. Like consent is an absolute principle. So, mm-hmm. and she quit. She said, "I'm yeah, out. Yeah. I don't can do this anymore." Okay, so she sends me this article. And it's a brilliant article. Now, I don't know what her politics are. Is she left? Is she right? Is she libertarian? What does it even matter? Exactly. You know, but if I were going to put, if I were going to guess, I would say two thirds of my writers have been historically leaning progressive or or socialist or left. Interesting. Yeah. Well, now, how has that come to be? How is it that you, with obviously... Um, a much greater connection to a, a very different world from that. Yeah. Have attracted so much quality content from people, you know, more in that world. Like yeah. that, that's that got to say something interesting. Well, what one has to do with editorial judgment. I only run quality content. Okay. So that's, I've, I've been very kind of strict about that. Like it has to be clean, has to be clear, has to be uh, truth telling, has to uh, connect with the moment, has to speak in a way that uh, you're not hearing from the mainstream press and so on. So I have these various standards. A lot of it's just intuition. But the people who are writing the most compelling content right now are disaffected leftists. Because <clears throat> that's they're the ones who feel the most passion. They're furious. They feel like they've all been betrayed. And they want their values to be uh, realized in some, some way. Uh, 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 in the world, and they, they feel like they've been betrayed by the left. So they have the strong and sinister right. Now, when I say the, the left, um, what I mean is not the Stalinist left, but I guess what you call sort of a, I don't know what you would call it, but like social like, democratic left? Maybe, but it's, it's this, this, this belief in civil liberties, democ- democracy, and inclusive society, a society in which every individual has a, has a chance. Uh, where we don't, where the state, state, state and society generally does not um, put people into, into castes or, mm-hmm. or uh, uh, dis- you p- permit a kind of uh, systematic discrimination against people based on um, race, religion, language, national origin, or, or, uh, uh, or, or history, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that sort of, I guess you would call it, maybe egalitarian, uh, maybe there's a better word for it, but that, that impulse that we can be better, all of us together as a community by recognizing everybody's rights rather than uh, just having an elite rule other people. Um, I, 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 and, 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 th- and, and, you know, in that framework, we should, we should uh, uh, extol the values of, of tolerance and inclusivity. Okay, because that's, I guess, what I would call the, the best imp- impulses of the left. You know, mm. I'm not sure I would call that a right wing uh, value system. Okay. I, would, yeah, I would associate that with one. So all that it was completely betrayed and destroyed and smashed like thoroughly many times over uh, during the lockdowns and mandates period, you know, and so, so they're furious. And it was mostly done by the left and defended mm. by the left. So. So they're the ones that have the uh, the passion to write, you know. It's the disaffected left, which is a lot of people, and and a lot of intellectuals. And so they're coming to me because the left wing outlets have dried up. They don't feel an affection for the for the right wing outlets, which also requires the right uh, the, the 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 writers to uh, pay pay obeisance to right wing values, which I don't. So I'm kind of an open, open platform. So, you know, here's me, this lifetime radical by any standard, uh, running, you know, a very viral platform that's, that's inclusive and, and, and you know, moderate and uh, uh, I think t- tapping into certain universal values, you know, and, and that's why we've beaten the nation in traffic, why we're, we're ahead of Mother Jones, you know, why we're crushing every libertarian think tank, you know, uh, uh, and, and we're ahead of the Heritage Foundation, you know, I mean, um, wow. you know, Brown, Brownstone is doing very, very well in terms of reach and, and influence very well, I mean, very well. How, f- I've got loads of questions and this in a way is the least interesting of them, but it's the one that follows immediately what you just said. How focused is your content on the immediate issues of COVID vaccine mandates, lockdowns? Um, and are you looking at maybe throwing um, 
throwing things open uh, with respect to content and a, you know, letting this spirit be written into content that deals with a broader range of. Well, I ran an article, an article a couple of days ago by, uh, by an attorney in, in, uh, in London at a prestige law school. I can't remember the name of it. You would, you know, Berkshire or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but uh, basically it was an anarchist article. Uh, but the springboard, the the upshot of the article was like, we cannot tolerate a segregated societies. You know, we can't have a society of serfs, serfs, and uh, and masters. And uh, uh, but I look back at his history, and he's a young theorist, and he's basically an anarchist, right? So, but I ran this, uh, but he frames the article in a way that's like, okay. Let's look at the certain, uh, you know, the current current disasters all around us, and figure out. Uh, what led to this, and it's a deni denial of the equal rights and the equal freedoms to people. And so, um, so the, the I think I called the article somebody like hmm? you like this title, um, "Society versus the State: The Essential Conflict of Our Age." That's what I called it. So yeah, I'm branching out more into these philosophical areas. And from an editorial point of view, Robin, I look at it like this. Um, in our lifetimes, we've never experienced a crisis anything like this. And in fact, the whole civilization has never, in anyone's lifetimes, uh, maybe with the exception of World War II, uh, experienced a crisis like this. So, so it's, a, it's like a hinge of history. And, and so it's not possible, I don't think, to write in a compelling way about f fundamental eternal philosophical issues like freedom and rights without the framework of what's just happened to us. And so that's that's how I look about it. Look at it. It's like if you're if you're a, a European intellectual in 1918, is it possible that you're going to write compelling content that doesn't make reference to the Great War? I don't think so. So mm -hmm. this is our Great War. So yes. I look at I look as so I use my, the purpose of Brownstone is to use the crisis through which we've we've lived and currently live uh, as a lens. To, to, to understand uh, uh, fundamental philosophical issues that, 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 that give some hints into what it might look like to rebuild in light of what's happened to us. Because this is it, comes in the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or 100 years. So is it therefore an editorial requirement, and will it remain one, that articles, however philosophical they may be, directly, explicitly reference uh, these issues, not the necessarily, things. but I can sniff out uh, locked uh, pro lockdowners and pro mandators very quickly, and those are they, they will never happen. <laughs> that will never happen. Like Good. you have to be, you have to have a clarity on this on 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 the last two years. Yes. Uh, or I I have no interest in, yeah. in your content. You know, yeah. whatever else you. That's say. the litmus test. That's your litmus test. It right? is. It yeah. has to. Yeah, has to. absolutely. I, I, I hear yeah. that. Now, going back to something you said earlier that's very interesting to me about um, your encounters with the in increasing numbers of, let's call it, the disaffected, maybe social democratic left. Is it your feeling that as a result of this, the left will be remade, or the right will be remade, or both? Yeah, the left is going to be more remade than the right. But I do think the right <clears throat> is undergoing its own micro upheavals. The, the left is definitely being remade. I mean, the ACLU oh. has been so discredited, you know, uh, among, it's all, um, among everybody in the left, you know. Mm. I mean, let me, just, let me just put a fine point on it, if I may, Robin. So up until like three days ago, uh, Washington, D.C. had a vaccine mandate for all public accommodations, okay? So if you are not vaccinated, double vaccinated, uh, you're not gonna be able to go to the, go to the, uh, the movies, uh, to a restaurant or the museums or the theater or anywhere else. Um, you're, you're, you have to stay in your home. And if you're gonna go out and eat, um, you have to eat from a, a, a street truck or something like that, right? So, yep. so it only takes you one second to look up the demographics of vaccines in DC. Among whites, it's about 75, 80%, something like that. Among blacks, it's 50%. So you had a law in Washington, DC, which has its own internal government structure, 
that's not a state, but they have a, a mayor and they have, you know, a city council and that sort of thing that was banning half of the African-Americans in the city from any access to public accommodations. So how do you account for that? I mean, like, we have heard tales of segregation for our entire lives. And if any city had announced, you know, here's a policy with a, a disproportionate impact on the community of which half of the minorities in this town cannot get a meal, cannot buy a sandwich at a sandwich shop, go to the museums or theaters or the libraries. Uh, that would have provoked massive moral outrage. I've heard not a peep about that. Same but it's the greater good argument, though, isn't it, Jeffrey? Isn't it still the greater good? And mm -hmm. once that, when you know, once our focus, the, the focus of those leftist administrators or governors, let's say, is taken off this particular greater good, they'll be back to being outraged by such policies that, let's say, inadvertently discriminate in that way. Well, there certainly are inadvertently discriminating. I mean, you can say invert, but I mean that that's also true. With you know, we we also live in a world in which, you know, I'm not allowed to necessarily hire you know p people on their merits. Like if yes, uh, if I'm running a big corporation and I live in a, a community that's you know allocated in this particular way demographically, there's a, a legal expectation uh, that to some extent, at least not wildly disproportionately to the relative to the demographics community that my workforce will reflect that. And if it doesn't, then that's evidence of my discriminatory intent. All right. Yes. Okay? So, so these laws have been outrageously racially discriminatory mm -hmm. outrageously in New York, Boston, and DC, the most progressive cities in the country have been instituting ridiculous laws that are, uh, are disproportionately uh, exclusionary to, uh, to the, the people that the, the left claims to help. And so that is not a sustainable position. And, and there are many sincere people on the left out there that actually aspire to uh, see these values realized in, in public life, you know? And, and when, the, when the leftist regimes in these big cities uh, enact policies that are contrary to that, that you know, for the honest left, they're going to be outraged. And that, I would say, are the most of the writers that I'm, I'm attracting are people that, are, that feel moral disgust about mm. what's happened to their own communities, you know? But these things, these things are possible, surely, Jeffrey, because um, most of any tribe are not putting their integrity, their honesty above their tribalism, right? So in D.C., this thing can carry on because... Um, you know, there's just support from people of political like mind for that policy, probably many of them black, actually, um, you know, because they, you know, they support the people implementing the policy, even if, you know, you could point out to them that it's kind of discriminating against them as a community. Isn't it just the same old, same old, never going to change? I mean, is can we get anywhere by pointing out these issues of consistency in terms of political uh, change? I don't, you know, I don't, I think it's our pointing out that's doing it. But I, th I do think that in the case of D.C., there were a number of factors, and we should talk about this more, like what is lead leading to the unraveling. But there are a number of factors that, that were there present for the, for the mayor when she repealed all the restrictions. Uh, but one of them surely must be that in her own community, many uh, Black folks in America are vaccine hesitant, you know, for not irrational reasons, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, given given the history of state medicine and uh, as it pertains to the black people in, in the United States is really grim. You know, there's the speed of vaccines. There's the fear of of, of the adverse uh, effects, which is which are very high. You know, with these vaccines and so on. So there was that. That was a pressing problem. But there's also the revolt by the business community um, because because there were. You know, the protests that were attracting hundreds of thousands of people against against these policies and everybody was standing in Virginia and Maryland and causing massive loss of revenue to the small businesses all over D.C. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think those are the two main considerations, the hospitality industry, the mm -hmm. restaurant industry, the bars, and also just the, you know, the realizations that, you know, the, the, what kind of country are we? You know, what are we doing?
this is crazy. You don't want set up segregation and exclusion. But, but this is exactly that. what we are doing as a country. And it's this oh, minority yeah. of the left that you're talking about that, uh, that are agreeing with you, agreeing yeah. with us that yeah. this is an outrage. Isn't yeah. it always going to be a minority? I mean, uh, me, uh, well, yeah, whilst we're having be. this conversation, yeah. Joe Biden um, is insisting that the next, um, uh, you know, justice on the Supreme Court has to be chosen according to color and gender. Now, yeah. you know, you know, here we all are. Um, is this, a, you know, a lot of this stuff, especially like free speech stuff, affirmative action, all of this kind of idea, you know, reverse racism, whatever you want to call it. This has been building and building before COVID hit. Do you think that change in, I guess, cultural norms, political norms, provided a background or a context that has moved some of the honest left um, to just kind of jump uh, in the face of COVID? Or was and the lockdowns and the mandates, or is it is all of that? It's not that, you know. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm saying is there a bigger yeah. trend of which this is a part? I, I really is it just think- a big straw to break camels' backs, or is it just all about the mandates and the COVID and all that? I really think it comes down to the uh, professional interests of of the advocates themselves. So you have really a conflict between the the patrician left and the uh, plebeian left here. Yeah. You know, so people who are paid to be leftists. Uh, have been all about mandates and and lockdowns and and basically Stalinist style um, uh, impositions and and right now today they're ch- celebrating, you know, the breakup of of the truckers in, in Ottawa. You can tell who these people are. Yes. But then you have another left that's that's a philosophical left. You know, that that's just the good hard good hearted people uh, that never liked the right, never liked the Republicans. You know, just was never really there. And thought that goodness flowed from the left, basically, you know, but they're not they're not paid to be leftists. So those people have been free and independent to be malleable and, and adapt. And those are the people that Brownstone's attracting, I would say, primarily not the patrician left, but the plebeian left. Will this mean that those paid to be leftists, to use that nice expression, will have to start um, putting out different product? over time as the plebeian yeah. left start to uh, be heard and yeah. have effect. Well, not so long as they can uh, have power, right? I mean, that, you know, this is the one thing I think we've learned is that, you know, power definitely corrupts, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. and so these people are paid to hold the views they have and there's no limit to it, you know? I mean, I think we, as we've seen in the streets of Ottawa today, you know, they're, they're okay with, uh, you know, one, one day it's defund the cops, the next it's, uh, arm the cops with with uh, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah artillery i mean the lack yeah. of consistency is absolutely astonishing isn't it i mean it's it it's kind of mind numbing almost well you you wonder robin about a lot of things you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> that we used to believe and which suddenly vanished from the headlines and vanished from our vanished from our political values they just went away uh, you know, and we should, we should talk about the right too. You know, I mean, the right had its own problems, I and mean, all of which stem from the fact that it was Trump himself who uh, pushed the lockdowns in the first place. You know, blocked the travel and and bought into the, the to the whole hoax. Um, it was he who uh, acquiesced, and so um, and their tribal, and so it's taken them two years to come around to finally criticizing. Uh, the lockdowns with in a full throated way, you know, mm. um, and and like I look at National Review, you know, which was one hundred percent pro lockdown in the early days, you know, from from March really for a full year after that, while well, the editor was finally moved out and a new editor brought in, and now they're they're speaking in in a in a in a sort of good way, but it took them a uh, better part of a year and a half to come around. Do you think we will look back? Uh... And if so, how long will it take? And say, oh, my God, we were in a mass delusion. Oh, it was one of those. It was, a, it was like a tulip mania of um, rights don't matter. Is, is that going to, are we yeah, going to do that? Or is, are we going never going to have that intellectual it, reckoning? It, it will happen. It's, you can slightly see uh, signs of it now, but we're nowhere near where it, where it needs to be. 
Um, but it's starting to to seep out a little bit. I do think we're going to return to a kind of a, a rational uh, perspective. I mean, you know, Albert Camus in his book, The Plague, talks about this, you know, that they they were under lockdowns for a very long time and people were spinning around in circles and hiding out in their homes and, and terrified and everything. And then the plague goes away. Um, and then people wondered why they went so insane and why didn't they focus on therapeutics and why didn't we just think about staying, you know, getting well if you got sick and moving on with normal life, you know? I mean, that's, that's how he describes it. There's this uh, decompression uh, point. Now, in this case, we don't so much have a plague, except the plague is uh, politics. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that those days are coming. I think they're sort of happening now. I think California has opened up, right, where you live. And so the governor- I'm in Seattle. In Seattle, okay. Yeah. Well, the yeah. governor of, of California just announced today that well, you know, the virus is going to be endemic, you know, protect yourself, you go to the hospital if you get sick, you know, that kind of stuff. It's only normal I, things. And actually, the governor of my state, Washington, um, I think it was a couple of days ago, said um, uh, there's, you know, the, the mandates. Actually, maybe it was King County, the, the county that Seattle's in. Um, I'm now going to be able to go out to a restaurant without showing papers. Um, really? Starting, I think, I think it's March the 1st. Now, does this, oh. does this suggest that are they pulling back from this outrage uh, just in time that the thing, the civil disobedience that might have happened won't happen? Or was it never going to happen because we were always, enough people were always going to keep their heads in the sand, um, you know, for however long this thing lasted? Well, you know, I, this is one of the things I like about our conversations is that we're both aware that history does not follow in a straight line and that nothing's clear. There's no one causation. Um, but I think there's been, and we should study this in greater depth because I can count on maybe two hands in the last uh, uh, century in the United States uh, political realm where a really bad law, you know, wrecks so many lives and was, uh, was you know, repealed. I mean, you can think about prohibition, deregulation, late 1970s, something like that. But right now we're seeing this collapse of this kind of uh, like I, I assumed actually that uh, vaccine passports were going to be forever. I thought that was the new normal and we we're all going to live that way. And then suddenly, boom, one day it's all gone. I mean, it's just incredible. So I think it was a combination of a, no a number of things. Uh, the trucker protests, you know, uh, the protests all over Europe, oh, yeah. the fact that the truckers were coming to the United States, uh, public opinion polls uh, showing uh, everybody's sick of this nonsense, you know. Uh, but then there was the, the 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 political demise of the Democratic Party, which is apparently their internal polling is showing that they're going to be wiped out. You know, uh, and we think November. it's because largely of our experience of lockdowns and mandates. Is is it, that's yeah, what yeah. it is? Is it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, and it's you think the, it's that without and not these other things like you know the the takedown of free speech that was happening anyway. You don't think it's any of that. Yeah, but it's it's all related though, Robin, because no, well, to yeah, my point. I, yeah. I mean, just yeah, I mean it's all connected. So one of the most hilarious things that that happened to us is that I mean, I can't believe the trajectories that we've we've followed here, but uh, for whatever reason I cannot fathom, uh progressive uh and democrat, you know, left-wing politicians in this country not only locked down schools, shut down the public schools that they themselves created as the great crown jewel of progressivism, shut them down, uh, forced the kids to go home, closed the malls so they couldn't go to there, and then shut the workplaces so the parents could take care of them at home. So what was previously sketchy and, and lived under a cloud, namely homeschooling, became mandatory for everybody. A third of uh, professional women had to leave their jobs so they could take care of their kids at home. But then that gave them an opportunity to actually look into the curricula that they're studying at, at, at school. Well, now that's an interesting point. Yes. Yeah. And so suddenly they're like, okay, what are you learning in third grade? And the teacher gets online on the Zoom call and tells, you know, tells them that all, all white people are evil or something like that. And she's like, wait, this is what your school is? This is what you're learning? And, and so next thing you know, they're involved in their school boards. You know, going to, hey, this is an outrage. And then it got worse because once the schools go, opened up, they're like, okay, your kid has to wear a mask. And if it tests, if your kid tests positive, they say, I have to quarantine for 10 days. And so on. It went. They got furious. And you don't want to make moms angry. Mm. 
So it was the lockdowns that led to this new consciousness that I should be in control of my kids' lives and their education. And that's leading to this wild upheaval, you know? A wild well, upheaval in education across the country. That's and Reddle, making some Reddle, big claims. I mean, this sounds very exciting. I mean, this almost oh, no. sounds like, you know, we might net out positive if it keeps going this way. Oh, I definitely think we will. I mean, I don't like wow. to talk that way because, because there's so many people that are suffering from cancer and depression and suicides and broken families. And it's just like the carnage is so ghastly. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to finally c- come to terms with uh, that we have been surrounded by corrupt uh, institutions and, and, and evil uh, public policies for the whole of our lives. And we just only woke up to the reality. Um, cognitive dissonance, the need to avoid it, is a massive driver in politics. I mean, it is in every individual's life. But there's a lot of people that are going to have to admit that the thing they were supporting was tyrannical or they were duped or whatever it is. Are enough people going to say, yeah, I got that wrong. I was complicit that, that we're going to see such a positive difference uh, going forward. I don't think hardly anybody's going to say what you just said. And that makes you sad and it makes me sad, but I think we need to realize this, that wrongdoing will never be admitted. Uh, I think I can count on one hand the number of political figures in the world that I can think of that said, I did the wrong thing. I'm but thinking about never... regular Joes. I'm oh, thinking about the mums. Wrong. Because there are plenty of mums, for example, mm. that at the beginning, with the misinformation they had, went along with it. Oh, well, yes, you know, we'll close little Johnny's school. Oh, well, yes, we'll put a mask on little Johnny, whatever, whatever. And now, to your point, they've they've discovered more. The information is is oh, yeah. more. Okay, so it's, will it's, will it's, the it, public yeah. say that? Yes, uh, I don't think it's going to be as conscious as you describe it, but but there's going to be a very slow uh, remolding of public opinion that's going to come out of this. Like, I don't trust the media. I don't trust big tech. I don't trust those politicians. I think what you're saying is nonsense. I mean, Biden said the other day that he feels our pain because of inflation. Now, I, I mean, what, uh, you know, it's, it's a weird comment because, because like what percentage of people listening to that comment is going to, f- are, are going to feel better about paying 20% more for, for beef at the store because, because they know that Biden feels their pain. I, you know, I would say the answer to that is zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's crazy, right? It's we no longer live in a world. In which, and that's kind of good that, you know, when we discern the empathy of our political leaders, it makes us feel better about our plight. No, it doesn't work anymore. That is bullshit. And I'm reminded of one of my mother's favorite mottos, which uh, is goes something like, it's okay if you think I'm an idiot, but if you do, don't let me know that you think I'm an idiot. (laughs) And it's almost like Biden's, no, that line of Biden's is 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 that it's like how stupid do you think we are? Uh, are people becoming more? I don't know. Able yeah. to notice when oh, they're yeah. being treated like idiots? Well, is that part we're of what living, we're yeah. See? No, this is the funny thing about lockdowns and mandates and everything we've gone for the last two years is it's it's given rise to reality, a, a new realism, and it's and it's stripped away the veneer. I mean, you know, in the old cliche, it's the Wizards of Oz and pulling back the curtain. And so many people see it now. And I don't, you know, I'm not just making this up. I mean, the, all the polls show, you know, massive decline in support for, for all the elites, you know? Mm. And, and, you know, in our, in our in, I, I don't want to say our, I would say my old fashioned libertarian view where the society is good and the state is bad. Uh, we'd like this to be associated only with the political order. But unfortunately, we live in a time when, the political order has learned to outsource itself largely to the private sector, uh, particularly to the big business and, and uh, technology companies, uh, which in turn, you know, you know, invades, you know, the uh, local governments and then HR departments and corporations, you know, and, and, and so you have this sort of this virus of, of, of compulsion yes. and, and woke ideology invading every institution. And, and they went all in, you know, especially during lockdowns. 
And now they're all collapsing, you know? Now, I'm glad you mentioned big tech because I wanted to talk to you about this as another kind of bigger general issue. I've been writing, I mean, nothing, nothing like you, but I've been writing for about a decade and uh, I've written hundreds of articles and in you know, a book that you kindly did the forward for and so on and so forth. And I have never been censored. Um, in the last two weeks, I have been censored by Facebook and Google and Twitter. I am now suspended from Twitter, have been for a month. They tell me they're looking at my appeal, but they're obviously not. They actually, um, I wrote a little blog about this. They demanded that I tell a lie so that they would let me back, uh, give me access to my account. I, I don't need to bore you with the details of that, but that was astonishing to me. Um, Facebook slapped uh, some notice on a link from a uh, Washington Post article about the ineffectiveness of mandates that I posted. My comment was merely, I trust we're all following the science. That was my entire post. Um, and the um, and YouTube, get this one. I've st I started just a little new kind of podcast with a buddy of mine. Um, I'm a British American, as you know. He's a French American. We're both American patriots who aren't born here. And um, so we thought we'd do a little show about, we call it from the outside in, uh, outside perspective about what is inside. And also we're from the outside on the insides from the outside. So anyway, we did a little show explaining what our channel was going to be about. And then our first topic based show, which was our second episode was on COVID mandates and lockdowns. YouTube had it taken down within an hour of our putting it up. And I am not a controversialist as well. You know, I am by training um, by academic degree, a physicist and a philosopher of science. I kid you not right from Cambridge, a school you may have heard of. I wasn't making stuff up, but YouTube wasn't having it. So I am, I was off YouTube, off Twitter and Facebook. I have, to, they still let me on, but you know, they, they slap stuff on my, on my posts. So um, censorship, I feel personally, although I knew it for a long time, that I'm living in a very different world um, from the one I lived in say, well, 10 years ago when I started writing and, and getting interested as, as, as a politi in political activism. Um, this is what makes me feel like I'm more in 1984 than anything. Um, I felt a bit 1984-y with the mandates and the lockdowns, and I did my non-compliance, and I'm privileged enough that I was able to live a happy life, you know, not going along with that, not sh sharing my, showing my papers and not going to bars and restaurants for a while. But when I cannot even say that I did that, it does feel different. It feels scary. Do I need to worry? From what you're saying, I don't, but it feels like we've crossed a, crossed a big uh, Listen, I, I agree with you that I've been censored too, never blocked, which, so you have more street cred than I have. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not censored these days, you're not trying, Jeffrey. You know? <laughs> I know, apparently. I, I just speak in too convoluted a way or something. I don't know why I haven't been. <laughs> I had a friend who just today posted a, 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 a link to a Brownstone article on his LinkedIn account and uh, that criticized vac vaccine mandates. And it was taken down, you know? And so LinkedIn's getting much more strict. So all the big tech platforms, Microsoft, Google, um, yeah, Twitter, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, they're all being, Spotify, of course, is, you know, faced this. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the Joe Rogan thing. Pressure and God bless them, they didn't give in. But and now we're facing a weird world, you know, in which we're having to, you know, experiment around with other uh, platforms. So we don't know where to go, right? So people say, oh, don't worry about it, go to Gab. And people, other people are like, no, if Gab's terrible, you should go to Parler. Well, no, don't go to Parler, go to Getter. And so, you know, it's like, huh? So, you know, you've got to have, you know, 18 tabs open where you're <laughs> posting all these things, these non the non-censored platforms. But, but uh, I think they're killing themselves. Um, do you do you think so, Jeffrey? Because I think you. you know we moved moved that little podcast to to Rumble. I think we probably had thirty five people watch it. Um, you know, it's never going to have any impact on anything um, because it's on Rumble. Yeah, it's um, a transition phase, though, Robin. We're we're in a so. transition. Yeah, we're in a transition phase. I mean, there's Rumble. You are the optimist. I thought I was the optimist. No, I, you're I, the optimist. I, no, it's just. You know, it's a it's an industrial upheaval, and okay. those who sign up to be with the state eventually get. To, Get, uh, get destroyed. Of course, they, they get enormously rich in the meantime. Now, but what about the effects on politics and culture, you know, during this transition? I mean, if 
you know, it's the John Stuart Mill thing, right? This is why we need free speech um, to put get the ideas out there, uh, to give people the chance of even, you know, of hearing the right one, let a, right idea, let alone identifying it. Um, I, uh, I mean, it seems like you've got very large corporations doing, you know, doing the bidding of the state, or at least pursuing policies or perspectives that the state likes that we do have a word from that for that um from the 20th well, century. I, th I think I, I would actually strengthen what you said i would say that they are the state uh, oh now okay so now then i want to ask you the big question which is um the public square if you know property rights versus the right of the individual in the public square where are you on that where are you on um whether you know the property the property rights of you know we can argue about what these terms mean but um you know youtube and uh, and, and all these companies google and facebook and twitter mean that they can just cut speech because they're not the government so my first amendment right i've got on the wall behind me doesn't apply um you know i have no i obviously not entitled to their service that's true but you know uh, my friend my french friend that i was just talking to you about said okay we're it's essentially a utility now. We can't have the water company turning off your water because they don't like your politics. We've got to apply some of the same logic to the big tech uh, companies. I don't, entire, Where I, don't you on I don't entirely mind that. And I totally understand that impulse. Uh, so I, I think just by way of background here, you pointed to the constitution on the wall in which is a document you adore. And I think about the, you know, that enlightenment generation in general is having a great insight, which is like the greatest evils in, in world history have been done by governments that are out of control. So let's draft parchment and set up institutions that restrain the state. Okay. So the state, let's just anthropomorphize the state for a minute and pretend as if it's not just a bunch of fools. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's hard to pretend that these days, but yeah, right. I'll go with you. <laughs> In this bizarre uh, thought experiment, let's let's imagine there's a, a little beast out there. It's slightly stupid, but 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 clever over two hundred years. Finally says, you know what? We're, we're we're facing all these constraints. I mean, is there anybody out there who doesn't face these constraints? Ah, private industry. Well, let's just use them to enact all of our uh, goals, and then we get around the court system entirely. And then the First Amendment doesn't apply. We don't have to obey the Fourth Amendment. We don't have to obey. Any of these amendments, you know, all these restrictions on government don't pertain to us because we're uh, the or, or I'm speaking to say don't pertain to them. So let's let's get in good with them. You know, right? So let's let's um, uh, let's figure out how to merge the private industry and the state through through HR departments, through mandated benefits, mm -hmm. through withholding taxes. You know, whatever the thing is, like ever more merger between. Uh, the public and private sectors. And then we, it's just a matter of pushing buttons. They can do anything we want. The courts can't touch us. And then we achieve everything we want. And it's even better. We don't have to take responsibility for it. So that's what's happened. Um, and by the way, I don't mean to condemn everybody at Twitter, you know, or everybody at LinkedIn. You know, I have good friends who work, or Facebook, good friends that work at all these institutions. And they're mortified by what's happening. But they're not in charge of their bosses. Their bosses are in charge of them. And so, even their bosses have bosses, and it's mostly the HR department. You, so they're all compliant. You made, I think you made the claim that big tech is the state, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I remember in a debate that you and I might have had on a stage between um, Manarchy and Anarchy, saying that to all intents and purposes, your private entities become the state to those, uh, you know, right? And I think you've just actually said we're there in the real world. This was yeah. why I said, you, you know, your theoretical anarchy, you, you, you can't have it. And um, now here we are in the real world. So first of all, I'm going to say, <laughs> I think I win that one. <laughs> but, but more would, importantly, would, because that doesn't matter at all. I'll I'm leave that, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in, in the simple way you put that. To say that, um, let's say, you know, these, these guys are the state, especially when you also said, which is interesting, that most of the employees, I guess the uh, big tech civil service, um, you know, they're mortified. Um, how how does that work then? How is it that uh, you know the likes of Zucker and what the other all their names are um, are the state? What's the mechanism by which they're uh, well? They had to become that for survival, and it all began uh, in World War Two. Uh, okay, 
so so mm, all right so but you know but there's a symbiotic relationship there right so yes uh uh so uh you know in world war ii um it all began i think it all began with with uh, with with uh, uh private sector provision of 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 health care health care yeah oh yes uh, that particular yeah, evil it, of the united there, states yeah there were yeah. wage so it all began like this i mean it's yeah. like going way back but there was wage controls so companies That's couldn't right. attract new employees so they started adding you know yeah. adding to the to the pot these uh, health benefits right and so it's the big companies who did it first because they're most capitalized and they can get away with this and they thought wow we have a competitive advantage against the small company so a decade later suddenly there's lobbying like well you know it's a pretty good thing to have health care for everybody maybe other people should be forced to do this too which is a great way to disadvantage uh smaller companies so now you're t- now we're looking at like 1960 or something like this and then you get the medicare benefits and then you get the fica cat taxes and and everything gets a little more intense and and ever more, the the uh, your 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 salary and your wages, are, um, are 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 basically invaded by 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 government uh, priorities, with the acquiescence of large businesses because they love the way it disadvantages their competitors. Because small small agency, I can tell you, it's very nonprofit. My God, the compliance costs are just unbelievable. Um, uh, large companies can, can afford these, small companies cannot. So they, they have every interest. In, and so they began to regard the state as their friend. Yes. And, then, then, and they began to love it, you know? And, um, and then with lockdowns, it became just the most extreme case because, uh, because every single company was forced in the position of making sure that everybody's faces were covered with cloth, okay? Because the, the cops weren't at the grocery store when you walked in. You know, they had to hire an employee to say, put that mask up over your nose. Right. And so compliance became, it was entirely a, a private sector thing. Yes, the whole private sector could have said, screw you, this is stupid, this is violating human rights. But it didn't do that because most of the private sector, at least the biggest players in the private sector, already signed up for this great job. And so... It was very interesting. We watch a correspondence between Fauci and Zuckerberg, right? So the, the you know the, the the virus came along, and uh, the lockdowns happened. And Zuckerberg just drops a note to uh, Fauci and says, "Hey, let me know how I can be of assistance to you." You know, so why would he do that? It's because he is a ruling class patrician, uh, basically imagines himself to be uh, an instrument of of power. You know, and so and so that's and that's true for Google. It's true for, for Microsoft. It's true for all these people. They feel a class identity mm. with the state. And it's mm. also true with the journalists. They feel a much mm. greater class identity with, with, with the state and its minions than it does with the truckers uh, or, or the people who deliver the groceries mm. or, or and, the and- nurses at the hospitals. And it was the same thing. And I know I always mention it, and I'm sorry to be boring, but it was Brexit was the same. It was the same. Um, So what do you think is the right demand for people who care about liberty, freedom, individual rights uh, to make um, about big tech, of big tech, and it's being, uh, you know, in bed with the state in this way? And and also, why do you think that... um, that this choice by big tech to get in the bed with, with the state is going to result in their demise as we go and prefer, as we prefer choose other platforms without those platforms going the exact same way or are we just caught in this cycle oh i think we are caught in an endless circle it's so sad right because okay. the largest business and 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 schumpeter talks about this in his yes. 1946 you know but it's like this is a sad sort of uh, cycle but it's it's gotten particularly bad right now um i think ultimately it comes down to you know uh, the values you hold. Do you believe in individual rights? And like I, I, I agree with the Constitution. You know, I, I think the Bill of Rights is a is a is a is a good document, and I think those rights are are real. And if they're rights, they can't be violated by by any entity, no matter how, um, uh, no matter what label you put on it. Whether so, it's, so whether you're it's state so it sounds you, like you're taking it. I mean, this is, I think this is a big deal. You know, Jeffrey Tucker has a position on, on this big argument right now that I think exists 
um, let's say, you know, among libertarians. As oh, to, listen, yeah, I companies, disagree. property yeah. rights or freedom of speech of the people that have no right to the service. Yeah. Well, so so I don't think it's as clean as what you say. It's, it, 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 you know, and I disagree with my, I have good friends who, who they, but I think, I think libertarians are very inclined towards these sort of binary uh, right. uh, categories. And it's just slightly silly. It's like, well, YouTube's private, they aren't. No, you don't understand. They do. They are, they, they signed up to do a public service. I mean, we know this about Facebook. We know this about LinkedIn. We know this about Twitter. I mean, what do you Twitter's, mean they signed up to do a public service? Was it a public service when they signed up to do it? Uh, well, they, it became that. And you could say they did it for their survival, but they, but they, they acquiesced to the, to the, the statist uh, agenda. Right, that's what you mean, yeah. When they yeah. agreed to play censor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and long before, really. Yeah, and I, it's 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 a complicated system. And in other words, most of these companies have long been serving the state anyway, but but they were tested when the state came along and said, "Hey, I want you to sense, censor uh, positions that did, disagree with the with the party in power." And they could have said no, but but then they face a very high price for that, right? I mean, um, maybe not as high as they believe, but let's just say it's much easier to go along. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, Elon Musk did not go along. So God bless him. Apple has been pretty good about resisting uh, all along. But you see what happens to them, right? So Elon Musk is now being demonized, you know, all over the place by the usual sub- suspects. And uh, Apple somehow gets away with it. I don't know how their reputation survived. I don't know, they maybe they have a if history of being, you know, um, be- beautiful products on the woke left or something like that. But, but, but the, the, the big uh, moguls who dare to disagree and go the other direction get, get torn apart limb from them. And Robin, the truth is that most people don't like conflict. They, they would, yeah. you know, people are very comfortable in their lives. You know, ever since, ever since we developed these systems by which um, uh, you get hired, then you get health care. And then you get unemployment, and then you get uh, whatever else FICA provides, and and then you get this guaranteed income, and your taxes are taken out, so you barely even have to pay those. Mm. You don't even see them. And then the money arrives directly into your bank account and flows out again to pay your cell phone bill and your Netflix uh, charges and and your HBO, uh, you know, charges and so on, and so, and, and your rent. To, so suddenly you have this beautiful life of utter meaninglessness but which is <laughs> fully funded and any slight challenge that you make to the system threatens you know not just one piece of it but the whole of it so people will far prefer the comforts of this digitized l- lazy meaningless life that we've created for ourselves uh, to standing up for any kind of moral principles um, Americans still, a lot of them, pride themselves on this history of rugged individualism, um, the frontier spirit. It sounds now like uh, it's the Canadians and the Europeans that are showing more of that than, um, and the Americans are just on their couches watching it on TV. Have we, you know, have we become, have we lost it? Yeah, yeah is, mo- is much of the rest of the world more American than America is? Well, you never know where America is going to pop up in the world, right? That's true. You never <laughs> bet against it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be Nicaragua, which well, that's never true. Locked, ne- yeah. Never locked down. It could be Sweden, which never locked down. You know, uh, uh, and I love your phrase "frontier spirit" because actually, it still survives in the American frontier. You know, the frontier didn't lock down. Well, I mean, South Dakota, Texas locked down for a little while, but the governor's in major trouble, and now they're furious. You know, and and dogged. So I think the spirit is still alive. Um, but, but, but a lack of civil disobedience or disruption relative to what we've seen in other societies. Should we worry that we're becoming, you know, spongy and mushy and we don't really mean yeah. it anymore? Oh, I mean, there's for every big city, especially in the Northeast, yeah, that is a, a huge and pressing problem. Uh, nobody cares anymore. As long as the bills are paid, right. people don't care. I mean, like... I, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I think we've both gotten a real education in how tyranny happens, you know? Um, I, I used to otherize 
despotism, you know? And uh, now I see how it happens. It's a very yeah. complicated process. It's not just some some bloviating fool with a with a mustache and you know, barking through a large microphone and a and a and a big parade. I mean, that's not that's not how it happens. That's not despotism. It's much more complicated, you know? It's it's systematic. Mm. And uh, it invades the culture and invades people's mm. brains and relies fundamentally on people's preference for comfort over disruption, exactly. you know? And, for comfort uh, um, instead of the discomfort of honesty, comfort yeah. instead of the discomfort of refusing to comply, comfort instead of the discomfort of integrity, yeah. uh, which is sometimes uncomfortable when there's a price to be paid for it. No, oh, sure. Um, but it also, it's a reminder, I mean, these little civic lessons we learned as kids, you know, that it's always a minority that stands up and, you know, for our rights and they pay a huge price for doing so. Okay. We're like, oh, this is a nice little piety. Good right, for them. Right. Good yeah. for them. But now we have our rights. So screw them. <laughs> well, it turns out, you know, and the other great cliche that has to be one anew in every generation, we never believed that. But now we discovered it's true. So... Mm. Mm. You know? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that we didn't believe it, but it was always it was always Abstract. an observation or, or, or something theoretical, right? Something yeah. known, but not something lived or experienced. Yeah. And now we're experiencing it, or at least we have the option to experience it. Yeah, it? and we're going to be we're going to be working through this problem for a very long time. Actually, uh, uh, the lessons that we've learned over the last uh, couple of years, as it relates to freedom and tyranny, public sector, private sector. Uh, the mechanisms of, of control, the human personality, the relationship between uh, the moral life and the public sphere. I mean, these are, this is all profound. This is, yes. these are all things that, that uh, these are all questions that are raised anew that seemed to be settled two years ago, or at least there were intellectual curiosities to us two mm -hmm. years ago, little parlor games we play, you know? Mm -hmm. And now suddenly we have to, we have to figure it out. Jeffrey, um, we could keep doing this. I'm sure we will in a while. Um, but I think this is a good place to end this episode. <laughs> well, I guess <laughs> if we, we can been, call it that. Yeah, we have been talking for a while, haven't we? But it just goes it's so fast. This is when we when we do our little uh, public shows that can go on for hours. And, and yeah, I love it. it. And the time flies. It's, it's good. Um, you know, I can I just point out something very interesting to you, mm. if you don't mind me observing this. Um, uh, we have talked almost not at all about our little tribe, which we used to call libertarians. <laughs> why do you suppose that is? Oh, I know why that is. Why? <laughs> um, I, could talk at, I could talk at length about that. I, I started stopping talking about libertarians quite a while ago. Okay. I, um, I, would, I would just suggest to you that the reason we didn't talk about it is because it doesn't matter. You know what? I would really love to talk to you about that because I think I might have said, I, um, I will, <laughs> maybe this is a setup for the next show. I <laughs> pondered to a former, I don't know that he was, the former chairman of the Libertarian Party a few years ago in Las Vegas, that there's probably an argument that um, uh, we'd see more libertarianism with a small L in American politics if there was no libertarian party with a big L and I was being a bit provocative, but um, the, for some time, the libertarians have, as, as you know, um, or maybe you'll dispute this, have spent their energy fighting each other um, rather than, you know, all facing inwards with their guns in a circle rather than outwards trying to, you know, destroy what needs to be destroyed and build what, build what needs to be built. You're so right um, about that. And if that energy that was, has been spent on each other, had been spent in the world, in the country, in society, in the culture, maybe we would have more liberty. It's a big, I mean, it's not a, that's not something I would stick my money on, but it's a perspective I think worth considering. Oh, I think um, right. And I, I think, think yeah, this... libertarianism is being reinvented. In fact, I think it's it's more pervasive than it ever has been, probably in 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 uh, in half a century or more. But it's not going to go under that name. It's something else. Let it's us else. let us talk about that next. Okay, because that is right up my street. Perfect. Let's do it. I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. That's a pleasure. Take care. Take care, my mm -hmm. friend. Bye. Grow peace.